Hello, my name is Tony. This was requested amongst a list of others by Casper Olson. John Lydon, also known as Johnny Rotten, once told an audience, one song is all you're getting. To all intents and purposes, for the time being at least, this is that one song. At the time of watching Bear Island, I was sitting A-levels, on days when there were no exams you were expected to study fastidiously. I'd spent a hard afternoon studying fastidiously the interior of the Guesty Back public house, where I'd been drinking pints of Heineken and some vodka and coke. Back then, afternoon drinking in pubs was curtailed with last orders at 3pm, with 30 minutes drinking uptime, the pubs closing at 3.30. They would open again at 7.30 until 11.30. With a nice little buzz on I left in search of sustenance, my male hunter-gatherer brain kicking in through the alcoholic haze. My hometown had two fish and chip shops, the one I favoured being the classic fish bar, which backed onto the town square and the market hall cinema, still does to this day as it happens. It wasn't raining, surprisingly, so I took my super healthy, mega saturated fat cotton chip meal with a tepid can of coke to a bench on the town square and ate and drank my fill. I wandered around the town until 6.30, nipping into a cafe for a coffee, reading a newspaper, until the doors of the cinema opened for the showing of Bear Island. Plan was, watch film, then get back to the pub until closing time, then home, bed, English literature exam in the morning. Good plan? Foolproof. Or would have been, until I found myself rudely awakened by an octogenarian usherette with a torch the size of a POW camp searchlight as the film ended. I fucking slept through it. I didn't even catch the opening. Now oh, well, back to the pub. Technically, I did go to see Bear Island at the cinema. I just didn't see it as such. Not until a year or so later when I rented it on VHS. Had I missed out on much? We shall see. In the 60s and early 70s, movie versions of Alistair MacLean novels were reliable, prime-cut, slam-bang action movie entertainment. Around the time of Fear is the Key in 1973, the quality began to dip. Bear Island isn't the worst big-screen adaptation of a MacLean novel, and never will be as long as the likes of Caravan to Vaccarez exist, but it's nowhere near the dizzying heights scaled by the guns of Navarone and Where Eagles Dare, or When Eight Bells Toll, or Puppet on a Chain even. It's like this. Think Agatha Christie plotline on dodgy illegal steroids bought from an unsecured internet site and superimposed over a snowy, rocky, isolated, freezing cold landscape and you're on track. Bear Island is a big, snowy, mountainous and desolate shithole somewhere off the coast of Antarctica. During World War II, it was used as a German U-boat base. In a small tent in the middle of nowhere, Larsen, Hagen begs, is trying to send a radio message to a ship called the Morning Rose. His communique is cut short when a big fucking snowmobile runs over the tent with him in it, then runs over it again for good measure. Larsen wasn't in the film long, but don't worry, he won't be alone in that. The Morning Rose is transporting a team of United Nations scientists and sundry others to Bear Island to study climate change. Now this is 44 years ago, so anyone who thinks concern about global warming is a newish phenomenon they've just discovered and that gluing your tits to a UK motorway will make a difference, think again. The UK contributes a total of 2% of greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale. If it sank into the sea tomorrow, the difference that would make to global warming is absolutely, um, let me calculate that? Fuck all! So calm down, dears. Try gluing your tits to a coal-fired industrial unit in China or India instead. There's an impressive cast list playing various members of the team. Richard Widmark is Dr. Guerin, the German team leader. His deputy Hartmann is played by Lawrence Dane. Vanessa Redgrave is Lindquist, a Norwegian psychiatrist. Why do they need a fucking psychiatrist? Well, why does anyone? Barbara Parkins is Rubin, a, uh, something or other. Christopher Lee is Lachinsky, a sinister-looking Polish bloke brought along to be a, well, sinister-looking Polish bloke. And Lloyd Bridges is Smithy, who's... I don't know, something technical or to do with security, possibly. American marine biologist Frank Lansing, Donald Sutherland, arrives by helicopter. He bravely decides to abseil down the chopper winch and onto the ship. Did I say bravely? I meant stupidly. He misses the boat altogether and lands in the freezing ocean. Smithy, a young and virile 66-year-old who doesn't look a day over 70, springs into action and has himself winched out to rescue Lansing. They're old friends, apparently. Lansing is also old friends with Rubin, so maybe she's a marine biologist too. You think? Who fucking knows? 
On arriving at Bear Island or being stranded there by the morning rose, however you choose to look at it, the team meet with two dodgy looking Germans, Young Beck, Nicholas Cortland and hater Michael J. Reynolds. They deliver the news that Larson has gone missing. You remember Larson, the guy who became one with a permafrost courtesy of a snowmobile pasting his ass into the ground. Things become more mysterious and convoluted when we learn that Lansing is the son of a U-boat commander who was based on Bear Island during the war, that the U-boat was carrying a cache of stolen Norwegian Norwegian gold, that Garen wants to find and repatriate the gold of the Norwegians to atone for his Nazi past, that Lindquist is working for Norwegian secret services, that Jungbeck and Hater are neo-Nazis working with an unidentified neo-Nazi agent known as Zelda. There are chases, shootings, explosions, snowstorms, avalanches and all sorts of action until the finale. When Smithy tries to take the gold for himself, Hartman is revealed to be Zelda and Lansing saves the day after discovering the fate of his dear old Nazi dad. On paper it doesn't sound too bad. On paper, the paper that was the original McLean novel from 1971, the scientific team was a film crew on a location shoot. And that's not the only deviation from the source material. McLean was not best pleased with the outcome, labelling it a clinker if ever there was one. Mostly filmed on location in Canada and Alaska, it was the most expensive movie made in Canada up to that time. A budget of nine million dollars. Let's call it ten though, because it went one mil over due to the weather caused causing delays in filming and logistical difficulties resulting from filming in an inhospitable environment. Director Don Sharp, a Hammer veteran, had worked on the speedboat chase for Puppet on a Chain and was good with action sequences, but not so good with a large cast of characters in intimate proximity, to the point where you don't know who half of them are, what they do, why they're there. A lot of the time you'll see someone appear on screen and ask yourself, who the hell is he now? And where did she come from? And so on. Too many people in the background and often the foreground with no definable role, identity or purpose or anything to do. Then there's a script by David Butler and Sharp which loses focus early on and inflicts upon the audience some of the most banal and distressingly risible dialogue imaginable. You know you're in troubled waters when Lansing and Lindquist start to talk about the sex life of the monkfish in a flirtation scene. I mean, no, just don't. Don't do it. Don't go there. Although the only version available to us mere mortals is a platter of VHS to DVD shovelware, it doesn't obliterate the magnificent scenery, and it's a credit to Alan Hume's cinematography that the ropey transfer fails to diminish the visuals too severely. Still much for the eye to enjoy. The set design on the interiors, especially the eerie submarine pen, complete with ancient decaying U-boat to explore, is pretty impressive. Then there's the cast, seasoned professionals, who seem to be going all out to see who can deliver the worst acting performance. It's like a competitive sport or they've laid bets. Those who attempt European accents are on a surefire winner, but the top spot goes to Vanessa Redgrave's mind-blowing sing-song Nordic vocals that make the Swedish chef from The Muppet Show sound like Olivier delivering a Shakespearean soliloquy. Just because somebody has given an order not to use the radio, Ein Befehl, Radio Verboten, Nothing is going to change your mind. How many more have got to die, Professor? The fuck is that? Any saving grace or graces would be the action and disaster scenes. It may have been a bitch filming on location and in those conditions, but the realism of the environment is a big plus point. The skiing scenes, notably during the deliberately explosive charge-generated avalanche, are quite impressive. Tons of snow and rock kill and bury Rubin, so Barbara Parkin's not around long either, and it nearly sees off Lansing as well. The exploding snowmobile that nearly kills Lansing, again, and Smithy. The unfeasibly tall radio mast that is rigged to fall during a nocturnal snowstorm, but only seems to land on and fatally wound Christopher Lee, so he's soon out of it and his role of principal red herring. A nice brutal punch-up between Lansing and Hay a fun but absurd chase sequence with Jungbeck and Hater in snowmobiles pursuing Lansing and Lindquist on snow bikes, which ends with one neo-Nazi getting an ice axe through the chest and the other plummeting down a precipitous ravine to his doom. The exploding generator that supposedly kills Smithy and trashes the lodge is a nice touch, leaving the team without power. And then there's the underwhelming end sequence. The final climactic event sees Lansing in a snowmobile chasing after Smithy and Hartman, codenamed Zelda, on a boat full of gold bars as they try to make their escape and kill each other, conflicting activities. These snowmobiles are versatile craft. Lansing's makes a pretty good speedboat, it appears, and after Zelda kills Smithy, he manages to catch up with and board the fleeing vessel.
Now, why do so many films that involve a gunfight or confrontation on a small boat seem to always rely on a flare gun to settle the outcome? Laziness, maybe, but that's what we've got here. Showdown, baddie with one bullet left, hero with a flare pistol. No contest, really. In the end, the dead are buried in the Nazi graveyard, which is nice for them, and Lansing's dad is vindicated. Seems he and his crew were clapped in irons and executed for refusing to surrender the gold of the Third Reich, just before the Allies' timely bombardment of the submarine base killing everyone else. Which begs the question, who dug the original graves in the Nazi graveyard? But let's not go there. My head hurts enough as it is. Bear Island is a badly scripted and stupid film, and that's an unavoidable conclusion most will be unable to avoid reaching. Now, I do wish I'd seen it on the big screen, because it is visually quite sweeping and impressive to look at. Plus, there's fun to be had with some of the ludicrous action scenes, the accents and dialogue spilling out of the actors' mouths, and said actors simply showing up for the paycheck and not caring enough to try and convince on any level. It's undemanding stuff, you'll know it's going to involve a neo-Nazi thread once you've strained your eyes to to make out that tiny, itty-bitty, and barely visible Nazi eagle insignia over the large fireplace at the base. I mean, I mean, you'd hardly notice it, would you? Unless you really concentrate, signpost much? If you are bored, listless, lacking energy, can't be asked to do anything meaningful, or that involves any physical activity or productive work, then you probably got fibromyalgia. I'd advise you to see a GP, but as sightings of those mythical beasts have been scarcer than dragon's eggs or real women for the last three years, you could watch Bear Island instead. You won't feel any better, but you may not feel any worse either. And anyhow, everyone's got to do something. Thanks for your time and attention. Like, dislike, comment, subscribe, or don't. Usual drill. Next up is going to be another requested review, and as luck would have it, it's a better film than Bear Island. Subjectively speaking, of course. And hopefully it will have the added bonus of getting the requester off my fucking back. And I do like an added bonus, especially one that benefits me. Later, pilgrims!